Okay. So uh, I worked at Newington Lodge. Then in 1968, when I was 17 and a half, I applied for a job with the Welfare Department of the London County Council. At my interview, I explained that I had done some voluntary work with old people in Abbey Lodge and felt that working with old people was something I could very definitely do. I got the job as a clerical officer and was told that I would be working at Newington Lodge near the Elephant and Castle. I vaguely knew the area, so wasn't worried about finding the building when I started work. So it was that in September 1964, I was walking down Westmoreland Road looking for Newington Lodge. From my volunteering at Abbey Lodge, I was expecting a large Victorian house surrounded by lovely gardens. There were plenty of shops and stalls in Westmoreland Road and some social housing, but no Victorian lodge. Finally, nearly at the end of the road, a large institutional building hove into view. It was sat behind a high brick wall and metal railings. There were large gates and a gatehouse. Not a genteel home set in a garden, but a real live workhouse. I didn't remember the word workhouse in my interview. Nobody mentioned it. And it looked a bit more substantial than an old people's home. And as I was to find out, it was more like a small village. I went through the gatehouse and signed in and a phone call was made by the gatehouse keeper to, to the office and then a very tall militaristic man came down the road. This was Mr Austin, an ex-guardsman and head of the male staff. He took me up to the warden's office but as the warden was busy he took it on himself to show me around Newington Lodge. It was a large administrative office full of fairly busy people, other smaller offices, and one much smaller was an office for the matron. Then there were miles of corridors, a dining hall, a canteen, kitchens, stores, and finally the mortuary. And it had one small body lying in it. Mr. Austin said that I shouldn't be afraid because the body was only a shell and the real person had gone elsewhere. He thought it best that I see a body straight away so that I knew what to expect when the funeral director turned up or a body shrouded in a cover was wheeled past me by porters. The very small body belonged to a very old lady and she was wrapped in a shroud waiting to be collected. I took a deep breath when Mr. Austin drew back the shroud to reveal a tiny old lady who looked as if she were sleeping. It was all very calm and reverential, so I passed his test by not fainting or keeling over, and it was the first dead body I had ever seen. As we walked back towards the main building, Mr Austin informed me that there were separate male and female wards, and someone would show me around them much later. There was also the homeless family unit, which housed about 200 mothers and children. Their husbands were housed in Arlington House as the policy then was to separate men from their families. The plight of homeless families in the 80s, 60s, sorry, was highlighted in Ken Loach's film, Kathy Come Home, made for the BBC's Play for Today slot. And it was shown in 1966, as Lisa has said. It was shot at Newington Lodge and made such an outcry that the charity shelter arose from it. Changes were also then made in the way that homeless families were treated. Christine Keeler, she of the Profumo affair, had a friend in the homeless family unit and came to visit her in a taxi. Everyone was very keen to see what she was like and peered out of the windows and made excuses to go to the front door. She was young and glamorous, which pleased everyone. They thought she was really lovely to have remembered her old friend. The families were given a medical examination when they came in so that any treatment that might be needed could be arranged for them. 
the doctors were stalwart supporters of the children and made sure that all of them, women and children, had a bath before they were examined. Some of them had never had a bath before and they were in great need of a wash. None of this was quite what I had imagined when I went for my job. And I didn't think I could ring up and change my mind. Besides, this job was obviously going to be a real challenge and I thought it was something that I could do and therefore I carried on. And I was about to enter into a weird and wonderful period of work. And by the end, I had had a really interesting and sometimes fun experience. The administrative staff was an odd mix of eccentric and straight. Mr. Callis, the warden, always wore a tweed jacket and a bow tie. He hobbled around with sticks, but became wheelchair bound after a while. He told me stories of his youth, his sporting prowess, which was the cause of his arthritis, and that he had earned five shillings a week in his first job, and that's 50p in modern terms. From the beginning, Mr. Callis had, the, had me running errands for him to Baldwin's the herbalists for garlic pearls and chili ointment. This was his preferred treatment for his arthritis. I also served as the other player in scalectric races. Mr. Callis had thought that it would be an exciting treat for the residents to play with electric racing cars as it would improve their mental and physical dexterity. He had ordered the largest scalectric set there was and had got Dave the storekeeper, who had worked on sets in Ealing Film Studios, to create a track with chicanes, tunnels and straights. Mr Callis was very competitive and had to win every race or he got very grumpy. The residents never saw the splendid racetrack or ever played on it. So much for mental and physical dexterity. Mr Callis was the warden lived in the big house surrounded by gardens situated in the front of the grounds. The Newington Lodge gardener created beautiful beds and lawns, both for him and the residents. Every autumn, we would have to order in all the seeds and plants the head gardener needed so that he could sow them in the greenhouse, ready for planting out in the spring and early summer. The flower displays and shrubs were wonderful. The deputy warden was Mr Spencer. He had worked in Arlington House at one point. This was the male hostel not far from Newington Lodge, where the husbands of homeless families and homeless single men were put. Mr Spencer lived in the Southwark Council flat around the corner from Westmoreland Lodge. His wife and two sons lived there with him. And this was because there wasn't accommodation big enough for them in Newington Lodge. Mr Spencer was firm but fair. The only time I was ever disciplined was when I was 15 minutes late back from lunch. I had whizzed into the West End to Regent Street where I had a pair of calfskin witch's shoes waiting for me. Lovely shoes cut no ice with Mr Spencer. Late was late. So I agreed to stay 15 minutes extra that day, which I thought was more than fair. A little later, I was told by him that I was not allowed to wear trousers or trouser suits to work. I had arrived in a trouser suit one Friday as I was going away for the weekend to friends in Hertfordshire. Luckily, I had anticipated this, so removed the trousers and put on the matching skirt. Ha <laughs> ha, it was a three piece outfit. Even when I left in 1968, it was still a policy of no trousers for women. The matron lived in a flat in the lodge and was in charge of all female staff, nurses, care assistants, laundresses and cleaners. She was a tall and imposing Irish nurse. Her veiled cap spread out behind her as she went down the corridors. Matron was immensely proud that on the whole, the residents were happy and settled, that there was cleanliness and order in the lodge. The assistant matron also lived in. She was very small and neat. Her cap was small and neat, just like her. 
She was in the Alexandra's Nursing Corps in the Second World War and was torpedoed twice. Both times she escaped uninjured. She had lots of stories about her escapades in the war and after. The care staff and cleaners at the time and the forces were mostly from the Caribbean, but lots of them suffered from severe colds in the winter because of our beastly weather. But seriously, nothing could have been achieved without them. They obviously cared for the residents and were proud of the work that they did. If you can watch My Little Grey Home in the West, which is showing next week, John Goldschmidt's film, that is, you can see them buttering bread, making tea and caring for the residents. There was also a team of nurses and doctors to provide medical care for the residents. There was a canteen which was run by Mr Beasley. He had worked in an officer's mess, so he only made real coffee for us. No instant coffee for him. He taught me to make it just as he did for the officers. You warm the jug, one heaped spoon per cup, and a pinch of salt and water off the boil. I still make it like that today. There was even a barber who came to shave the men with his straight razor to stop them from being whiskery. Mr Callis thought it really important that the male residents were clean and barbered. It was a matter of self-respect, he said. There was also, of course, a fully equipped hairdressing salon for the women. They were also cared for by a professional hairdresser. As Miss Rostin had said, the residents were put into separate wings, male and female. Even married couples were separated. The wards were quite crowded because the lodge was the only council care available at the time. Some residents were bedridden and able to move out of the ward. Able-bodied residents could go down to the canteen or the dining hall or out in the grounds or walk up the road to look in the shops and on the stalls. The linen room was almost opposite the admin office. It was full of women under the guidance of the linen room mistress, Miss Clooney. She was a fine seamstress and oversaw repairs and the making of required items. She told me that there was a store of Victorian uniforms down in the basement, but no one was interested in them, but I was, but I didn't dare say anything because after all, they would be council property even if they were useless for staff to use. The linen room was always a jolly place to visit. The women chattered and laughed as they worked. They obviously enjoyed their work. In the main office, a large area had been portioned off for the use of the deputy warden. The rest of us had large desks placed around the walls. Joyce Allen was the finance officer and she had the best desk, which was in the bay window. Mr Ellicott, the residence officer, Jane Perrin, the dietary clerk, Elsie Hardy was the typist, and Mrs Quinn, I never knew what she did, but she always stank the office out with Goya's freesia perfume. Eventually she left and we were able to close the windows. Her place was taken by Mr Richards, an ex Wingate's chindit. His job was to collect furniture to be used when a homeless family could be rehoused. They obviously wouldn't have the money to buy even second-hand furniture, so it was provided by Mr Richard's scavenging efforts. He told us many hair-raising stories about the Chindit's exploit in the Burmese jungle and how it was that they could never leave a wounded comrade behind. They had to be killed rather than leave them to succumb to Japanese torture. It had been decreed that I had to learn every job in the office or as much of it as was suitable. I think the worst job I had to learn was typing. Elsie Hardy, the typist, whizzed and clacked away at an astonishing speed and presented beautifully typed letters and documents. I struggled to peck and pick and was forever pasting over mistakes. I didn't learn to type properly until much later. Elsie had learned when she was young and had worked in the Southwark Borough Council War Room so I heard more stories of daring do in Southwark and what her lovely husband Jim's naval exploits were. Mrs Allen, the finance officer, 
was poised and elegant and had flaming red hair. She had a great reputation within Southwark for her straightness and brilliance in her role. She was married to a guy who was a spitting image of Errol Flynn. He was a bit older than her, so she appeared to me to be the same age as my mother. When I look back, she must have been about 35, younger than my mother, but I never thought it at the time because everybody appeared to be at least 20 years or more older than I was. I had to assist in counting the money for the wages. Mr. Spencer, Joyce and me were locked in a small room with Mr. Off Mr. Austin as a guard while we counted out all the money and then made up the wage packets for the weekly paid staff. But apart from once or twice, nobody ever treated me as anything other than an equal, which for a young girl was really quite amazing. Well, except for the chief welfare officer who said that I could have a raise because of my blue eyes. No, I didn't get the rise. I told Mr. Spencer what the chief officer had said, and I guess he had a word with him on my behalf. Jane Perrin, the dietary officer, had to work out how many meals each ward needed and what bread, butter, milk, sugar and tea they needed. It was discovered later that she had a way with half pints of milk when checking ward fridges. Unfortunately, Jane was a real snob. Not something that I came across in Newington Lodge. But she thought we were all beneath her. And it really shocked her to the core when her daughter had to get married. It was the end of the world to Jane. For in the mid to late 60s, being pregnant at the wedding didn't carry the same connotations at once it had. For poor Jane, it was such a blow. Don Smith was the assistant deputy warden. He drove a grey Austin A40 van. He was small and round and bald. He had the blackest fingers as he was forever fiddling about with his pipe. Sometimes he forgot that he had cleaned his pipe and rang his blackened fingers over his bald head. It was always someone's job to give him the once over before he met with the warden or visitors. His suit was black and shiny, but he had a lovely chuckly laugh. I had to learn how to fill in the giant register which charted residents in and out of the lodge. Numbers came up from the gatehouse and down from the wards and everything had to be collated every morning. Final figures were pho phoned into County Hall and later to the borough of Southwark so that numbers were registered and beds and finance could be allocated. Also, if Newington Lodge was full, People had to be sent elsewhere, perhaps to Luxborough Lodge, which was out of the area. When I first started at Newington Lodge, I had to work on Saturday mornings to ensure that the resident numbers were entered and to deal with any emergency that occurred. I also had Tuesdays off to go to college to finish my A-levels. After the exams in June, Tuesdays were just another working day. All the food at the lodge for the residents and the staff and the homeless family unit was cooked in-house. There were large, well-equipped kitchens under the creative hand of Mr. Scholes. He was happily gay and told me that he was sent to Gretna Green in the Second World War because of his homosexuality. They didn't want him to corrupt the troops. He was understandingly cross and had wanted to be on the front line with everybody else. He had cooked in hotels and cooked good food for the residents and created beautiful flower-like salads, which were a delight to eat. His deputy was Mr. Khan, a whiz at puff pastry and Christmas puddings. He also introduced curries, which were loved by all and sundry. When the time came round for making the Christmas puddings, some of the admin staff were allowed a wishing stir and to watch as Guinness and brandy was poured into the mix. Mr. Khan became head chef after Mr. Scholes retired. The Guinness and brandy was also ordered by the doctors for those bedridden residents who needed a little pepping up. They were given an ounce of brandy at night and a small bottle of Guinness during the day. I can't imagine that care homes today would be as careful, but who knows, they might be. Everything that was necessary 
for the proper running of Newington Lodge was ordered from Southfield's depot through Dave the storekeeper. From bisto and beef to brandy to replacement items, everything that was needed was ordered. The storekeeper was also known on occasion to order a crate or two of champagne. The living staff put their orders in for whatever it was that they had wanted and it was delivered to their flats or house on a Friday. Residents had to make a contribution to their keep by their pensions, that's if they had one. The residents' pension books were kept by an officer called the collector. He had an office in a separate building near the entrance gates, which had cells underneath it. The doors to the cells had small holes in them, and it was where homeless men were put after they had had a night's sleep in the workhouse. They had to break down rocks into pieces small enough to pass through the holes. These little pieces were then used in road building. Obviously, that practice had ceased and the cells were no longer in use. The collector's job was also to make sure that residents got an allowance. They could use the money to buy whatever they wanted, either in the canteen or off to stalls and shops in East Street Market, Westmoreland Road or Camberwell New Road. There was a Russian countess who arrived at the lodge and her keep was paid for out of her bank account. That was unheard of, which was why everyone has always remembered it. She was tiny and elegant and superbly dressed. And she used to tell me off for striding about when I should be taking small steps, as a young lady should. Good job she never heard me whistling and singing in the corridors. If residents wanted to go anywhere by bus, free tickets were issued. If residents wanted to stay out for a night or two or go on holiday with relatives, their beds were kept for them. There were two men who were odd jobbers. Leonard, with his big bright smile, always dressed in a form of railway guards costume with a peaked cap and everything liberally doused in grease. He would run errands to and from the town hall and he could tell you about any train anywhere. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of train timetables. He was a walking Bradshaws. He was given free travel on trains because he used to find people who were fair dodgers and reported them to the guard. The other chap was a resident and also ran messages. He wore a beige mac and a peaked cap in homage to Leonard. He was tiny and slim. He had been incarcerated by his family in a mental institution at the age of 18, charged with being a moral defective. It was in fact homosexual, which in 1900 was seen as being morally defective. He was released at the age of 65 and had gone straight into Newington Lodge. He felt safe in a big institution and could not envisage being in the outside world. The resident's spiritual care was provided by either the Church of England pastor, Mr Fairfield, or the Roman Catholic priest on rotation from the local church. I have no recollection of whether the rabbi came in. As an aside, Mr Fairfield jo ah, drove an MGC, which you can see in the picture, and then after had an E-type, and he let the social worker, whose name I've forgotten, drive it. They were very close and often drove out together. Actually, Mr Fairfield was kind enough to lend me his cloak and I wore it for my 21st birthday dinner. I liked it so much that later I made myself one and I still have it. Many of the residents suffered from dementia, something not really recognised at the time. If they became, in quotes, unmanageable, as it was called then, the residents were taken to a mental hospital or given heavy drugs to keep them calm. The lodge sometimes housed younger women who had learning difficulties. One woman came back time and time again over seven pregnancies. Each time the baby was taken away from her and put into an orphanage. It became apparent that she was being taken advantage of by men and she had no real understanding of what was going on. 
By her seventh pregnancy, a group of doctors and social workers made a case in the courts for her to be sterilized after the birth, and she was. If a resident died and they had no family, a funeral was arranged for them by Newington Lodge and paid for by the London County Council and later Southwark Borough Council. Mr. Francis from Francis Chapel Undertakers used to come along to collect the body. He'd always come into the office for the paperwork and sit and have tea if he had time. He would regale us with gruesome tales of some of their work and it certainly took away any fear of dying. Mr. Francis would return with the body coffined and in a hearse on the day of the funeral. A second car took the Roman Catholic priest or the Church of England pastor or an occasional family member or friend to the crematorium. A sheaf of flowers was provided and Mr. Francis made sure that the body was never left alone. There was talk in the care world following research in the Scandinavian countries about how people fared in small homes. The research seemed to show that people did better in small homes than large institutions. So there was a move to put residents into smaller homes and the really large old workhouses were being closed. Newington Lodge and Luxborough Lodge were the last to go in London. Obviously the land they stood on was valuable as land for development and for social housing. Newington Lodge began to reduce the numbers of residents it took in and a new home was built in Love Walk. My job then expanded to help Mr. Callis, the warden, to choose the furniture and equipment that would be needed. We spent ages pouring through catalogues of chairs and tables and cabinets, all was of the very best quality as it had to last and was false economy to buy anything cheap. We had to go to Love Walk to look at the site and examine the red cedar that had been imported from Canada for the roof timbers and ceilings. Nothing was too small for Mr Callis to look at and the home looked lovely when it was finally equipped. Eventually the building was finished and some residents were sent off to Love Walk. Unfortunately, lots of them died or asked to go back to Newington Lodge. They said that they were not allowed out had to behave and do exactly as the matron and care staff said. The nice chairs and the lovely architecture meant nothing to them. They didn't want to sit in a lounge with a loud television and unable to wander around outside, but had to be present at certain times of the day and at night. A few years later, there was an investigation into Love Walk as there was a claim that staff had been assaulting residents. I had long been gone by then, but my mother saw it in the South London press and told me. It was a far cry from the heady years of Newington Lodge. In early 1968, a film crew from the Royal College of Art arrived at Newington Lodge. The director, John Goldschmidt, wanted to make a documentary about life for the elderly in Newington Lodge and their beliefs and the routes towards death. The matron was really blasé about it, having seen and dealt with Ken Loach and the BBC crew filming Kathy Come Home. Roy Morford was the warden by then and so they both agreed that the documentary could be shot. It was called My Little Grey Home in the, Re in the West. The residents really liked being talked to and filmed. It was nice that someone from outside was taking an interest in them and it perked them up for quite a while. Even I was interested <laughs> interviewed for my views on death, not that it was used in the film. John told me later that I, it was a chance to talk to me. I left in June 1968 to get married to John Goldschmidt, who made My Little Grey Home in the West. It's a film I urge you to see if you can, and it gives a real picture of those residents and their thoughts and lives 50 years ago in Newington Lodge. So, that's it. Thank you.